Hello again and welcome to Failure and Analysis. My name is Kevin Jordan and we've got another theory craft discussion with the lads and lady. Um, this time it's about monetization and game design so it could get pretty spicy. Let me jump into the channel and we'll get started right away. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, Air. hello. Yes. What is going on, Kevin? Not much. What's cracking? Oh, not much. Just ready to start the show. Um, let's just get right into it. So this is Theory Craft, episode nine. Um, Candace can't be with us this week, but uh, our hosts, as otherwise usual, are Chris Kalaki, uh, Kevin Jordan, and me, Luca Fusi. And uh, this week, we wanted to talk about monetization in games. Um, but before that, we just kind of want to kick it off with asking Kevin how he's feeling after his first shot. <laughs> Any side effects? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually doing great. Yeah. it's. Uh, I think yeah. I got the super soldier serum, so I'm totally Sprout. ripped now. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah, the ladies won't stop, you know, looking. It's great. That's, yeah. it, it's perfect for streaming. It's perfect for a career in streaming. That's you right. need all that. That's right. Yeah, so <laughs> apparently the, the second one's the good one, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So far, so good, though. Yeah, that should... It's wild that it took... I just got mine two days ago. Were you just like... I mean, how's it work? Did they bother you about getting one? Did you were just kind of not paying attention, no. and then one day you're like, I should check, or... No, I, I, I live a pretty isolated lifestyle anyway, so... Um, mm -hmm. But uh, because I'm planning to... Uh, visit California. I figured it'd be really important to get one, get it knocked out before I go. So, oh, totally. So here we are. Mm, cool. When are you visiting well, California? Uh, end of June, early July. That's two weeks, and uh, I'm taking my oldest daughter, and she's got friends, and so she's going to be mostly with her friends, and so I'm just going to be kind of on my own, roaming around, you know, visiting everyone that you know I know and eating all the delicious restaurants I missed that are hopefully still open and uh, <laughs> yeah. visiting the beach. And it, it's weird because it's it's going to feel like the first vacation I've taken in forever. Like actual, honest to God, don't have anything to do, you know, mm -hmm. kind of vacation, which is kind of freaking me out because I, I, I haven't done that in forever, like as long as I can remember. Well, let me know because you're not really get a... lunch or coffee or yeah, something. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be fun. Yeah. You guys can get some uh, some taco time. That's right. That Irvine Plaza, the sushi joint there, that's like ninety yep. percent styrofoam. <laughs> I'm trying to figure um, out how to use okay. the Pacific Ocean as a uh, hot tub for my first hot tub stream as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. All right. You got uh, this out. All this, right. Cool. Let's let's keep it moving. This is obviously a really sexy topic, um, but there mm -hmm. are a couple of news items first that uh, that Chris wanted to address here. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a good thing to just keep up the tradition of the format. So yeah, anyways, this I just have three items this week. One is Dreamhaven has announced partnership with three new studios, including Lightforge Games, One More Game, and Raid Base. They all have all ex Blizzard alumni as well as some Epic Games veterans as well as riot um so this brings now dreamhaven has five studios i believe under their belt um, they have two in-house studios and then these uh three new ones that are partnerships so i imagine some sort of an, an investment relationship with them All right. um i don't know if you had a chance to see any of them kevin if you know any of the talent there i saw Some lightforge and i only know glenn rain um but yeah I, I, this is the first time hearing of the other two so yeah i'll have to look them up yeah, Glenn Rain is awesome. He's done a lot yeah, of uh, box art for Blizzard and a lot of the key art. Mm -hmm. Really, really one of my favorite Blizzard artists for sure. Yeah, and the relationship also continued after I went to Cryptozoic because we were still working on the WoW TCG and he was doing a bunch of art for that still. So uh, I got to see him occasionally, which was nice. Nice. Yeah, and second thing uh, item I have is... Uh, Discord has rebranded a little bit. Um, there's all this drama about uh, Blurple, the color. Bl I didn't. Do you know what Blurple is, Kevin? I don't. 
Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds like it's <laughs> the first Zoomer brain, color. Real brain teaser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So blurple uh, is the official Discord color. It's a mix between blue and purple. <laughs> um, and people were very emotional that blurple was being sidelined in the new update, which I thought was hilarious. Dude, um, there's there's like a, like a continued brigading about. Like I was sub to the Discord subreddit before this. I don't know why. At some point, I just did it and, and didn't get out of there. And uh, Man, it, I've just seen so many variations on the logo from random fans and players over the last two weeks. It's like, I don't know, it, it's kind of like the same energy people bring when they're just memeing about designing, you know, like a, um, a better system for weekly reward chests or something like that, where mm -hmm. suddenly it's like anybody who weighs in, it's just hilarious because the, the thinking is they're more of an expert than whoever this poor Discord graphic designer is because, right. gosh, there are so many of them. They're not all great, but... Uh, I'm not a fan, really. I don't like the font. I don't think that's a really hot take. I don't think a lot of people are stoked about the font, but um, they're just, really making it happen. I just can't believe there isn't already a name for the combination of blue and purple. I mean, there is, isn't there? <laughs> it's called it's called indigo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what the? <laughs> why did we need like a, a new one? <laughs> it's, it's kind of horrid. Yeah. Right. Dude, I don't. I, I've never had a blurple. That's. Yeah. I think they might be illegal in the states. <laughs> But um, yeah, and then the last news item um, is surrounding mm -hmm. all this fire on Amazon Games is uh, a yeah. monetization discussion with New World. Everyone's buzzing mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. So there was a the tweet longer from Amazon. He went uh, from from Asmin Gold. Sorry, he went in. But Chris, what what's your take on this whole situation? Oh, I was just gonna give the backstory. So really, so what happened was Amazon's games new mmo new world currently in alpha they had a post in their internal forums to my understanding detailing plans of a cash shop that would include boosts and convenience quote unquote features um and the, the community sort of blew up when this got leaked that they were sort of circumventing the gameplay of the game uh and to kind of address this the amazon game studio director rich lawrence address concerns in an open letter on Twitter saying that uh, these will be cosmetic in nature and that they're still qu testing quote unquote quality of life <laughs> items. Um, and as there Lucas said is. in response, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, as Lucas said, you know, Asmongold did this foot longer post, which uh, I thought this title was hilarious. New world, same shit um, <laughs> about how the game is, um, you know, jumping the shark with adding convenience features and boosts and things like that that circumvent, you know, in his view, what makes the game special, which is just, uh, you know, the journey leveling and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, and this, you know, this is our main topic now, which is going to be about monetization in games. And I titled the, the topic Designing Monetization because I did tweet about, you know, my view on monetization these days in games is just that. Designers really have system designers who are making the game, making the experience, making the systems need to have, be involved, in my view, on how the monetization is laid out. Mm -hmm. It can't just be like given, handed off to some business people and like, oh, you figure it out, right? Yeah. I feel like it ha it's so core now to the experience of the game, you know, and what players into like uh, the core loops and everything that I think it's so important that the system designers also have to be involved. <clears throat> and, um, yeah. You know, Absolutely. in regards to regards to, regards to Asmongold's comments, you know, I thought, you know, in some ways I thought it was a little harsh. I think, you know, they're still kind of exploring things. It is a alpha forum, you know, maybe these things are just, they're still exploring that they might not um, solidify on yet. But this is really kind of the only card the influencer or the player has is really to kind of voice their... <laughs> extreme distaste if they see anything right. they don't like um and then uh lastly just before i'll, I'll get your guys thoughts um tips out <laughs> had a good tweet i thought what she basically said you know i'm a i'm a dad gamer or i have a kid i have a kid and all, all these things and i only have so much time to play but i still don't want my play time to be you know diminished by these sort of boosts and convenience yeah exactly you know, right quote features so yeah, what is, uh, I imagine you've talked about this on your stream, Kevin. What's uh, your thoughts? 
Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it, it's funny. I, I talked, I think, a week or two ago about, you know, how you react to things emotionally before your rational mind kicks in, you know, when you hear, th- you know, the first the first minute you hear something. And um, I was on stream doing hardcore duos and um, my first reaction was I, I was actually angry. Like I, I was surprised later on about how angry I was <laughs> um, because I had allowed myself to get really excited about new world. Um, even though I saw, you know, a lot of potential flaws, which, um, you know, the, the MMO genre is, is really difficult to design games for, and there's a lot of potential pitfalls, but, uh, I was excited about just having something fresh to dive into. And it was so disappointing to hear this change, um, because it affects so much of your experience and your, your expectations of how the game is going to go and you know who's playing and how things are going to play out and it can have a really deep impact on so much about the game and, and then it calls into question you know that that sense of trust which is if if you don't trust the game developers to uh, design the game from a standpoint of you know what I what I would say is integrity in terms of like protecting the game experience from outside influences like you know money real life money Mm -hmm. um then what can you expect in the future when it comes to changing the game or evolving the game or responding to viewers or responding to your audience in a variety of other ways because it it can send a pretty strong message you know like oh we're going to proceed with this even though like the core audience that has been very vocal is really opposed to it um then that's already sort of this um, kind of line in the sand that the core audience's opinion doesn't matter to us as much as, you know, monetizing this game. And so that was my first take was, you know, just like I was kind of crushed in that, like I wanted to try this thing and now I'm not so sure I'm even going to log in for the first time, even to check it out. Like that's how much it affects my expectation of it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. this. I, I would bet that they're going to roll most of this stuff back um, for initial launch. I think that Amazon has the capital to be able to mm-hmm. just fully pull all this stuff back and say, whoops, you know, yeah. we, we didn't really read the room correctly and <laughs> just kind of try to get people in. Um, and, and people may forget about it. I mean, I remember years ago with Battlefront 2, just like the sustained controversy people had about, I'm going to have to play, you know, 5,000 hours, as it turns out, to, to unlock Lord Vader, or I could buy him for $10. And, um, you know, EA took a lot of heat, and eventually it seems like caved on a lot of that. And that game managed, you know, to have a, a lifetime um, of its own. Mm-hmm. I could see Amazon doing that. I think that, I think this really sucks for them, because like I said, it's it just seems like a real... A failure to understand what the uh, what the audience, what the vocal audience that's probably looking forward to this sort of game is like, and what they yeah. expect. Like yep. it, it blows your mind that they thought that something like this would would land, and it says a lot that uh, you know it even made it all the way to the point of like a press release. Right. I don't, I don't, I think it probably could be really effective monetization, but it's what you said about building trust and integrity. You know, Amazon Game Studio has really yet to. I mean, launch anything mm-hmm. really notable that people people you know know them for. So they don't have much of a reputation, and uh, they can't start you know cashing their their credit line in before they've even like built anything up. Yeah. So most of the takes I saw from people are like, look, if they eventually wanted to sort of start drip feeding this stuff in and boil the frog, they could. But you need to give it some time. I mean, Amazon Prime used to be just, you know, cheap as chips and mm-hmm. you just had it. And then they slowly raise it over time once people realize, like, I, I can't not have Amazon Prime anymore. Right. And I would have I would have maybe liked to see them do do that um, mm-hmm. and eventually get us to, you know, the, the monetization dystopia we're headed for and just yeah. come right out with it. I've made that exact comment yeah, on, on, my, on my stream in that, like, is this really the most effective monetization strategy? Even if your goal is to make the most money, like, isn't it better to pull everyone in with a sense of integrity and, and an amazing game and get everyone there and, and in hooked and then monetize the shit out of them, right? Like, it, it seems like, and you, you praise it so well, which is a comment I was going to make, it seems like they're trying to cash out 
before their currency is even worth anything because like your currency it takes time to actually establish itself like are, are the bots going to show up in new world day one or are the bots going to really ramp up once after they figure out oh this is a place where people value you know the money and the items and things like that right and bots are mm -hmm. a symptom of success right like the more people care about the things in this virtual economy the more bots are going to show up and so if they, they so that you, you know, by the same token, like the game has to establish itself as a place where people want to be and they want to play and the, and the things have value in terms of time and effort and skill. And, uh, and then, you know, value is established at which point, you know, the, the greed can then capitalize on that. Right. And, and start yes. cashing out. Right. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting that they're, again starting with that before they've established it has any value so i think it's going to bite him yeah, in the like ass it's sports to esports right yeah when you show up to a pax or something and there are a bunch of uh, high profile streamers already play by playing some game you've never heard of before and trying to make it seem like it's the next league and mm -hmm. you're like dude this is just so unbelievably cringy like you have <laughs> to let some of these things evolve organically yeah before you can take it to the capitalist endpoint we all know it's headed right but it needs to exist on its own merits for at least a little while i i don't know to me the only reason this is surprising is because amazon is you know a moneyed enough corporation that they could fully afford to to not you know, to completely bury the lead on their eventual monetization plan. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they could they could make the game fucking free for yeah. a year if they yeah. wanted to. They have a lot of latitude to experiment. Mm -hmm. The entire Amazon Games arm has been spun up, I think, in this very kind of incubatory way where it's like, no matter how much money we want to spend on pulling in all these high-profile developers, mm -hmm. let's just make something work. And it feels like this is the, this is the first really big thing that's going to hit the public and then this is like one of the first major right. announcements that's, that's happening about it it, it right. sucks yeah um for them well it, that said i think it'll turn around yeah like, i mean anyways. it's interesting that you mentioned this concept because this is actually exactly what <clears throat> a lot of tech companies do they call this concept like um i forget what it's called but it's but you know if you look at twitter or you look at instagram they didn't they weren't monetized for like years mm -hmm. you know when they started, they were all free. They had no ads. And then they add ads. And then they add a little more ads. And then they add, like, you know, um, they're you know, Twitter is talking about adding a subscription service within a couple months called Twitter Blue. And because uh, Twitter has constantly been criticized because they're not monetized enough. <laughs> um, Facebook did, wasn't monetized for a long time. No one knew, like, could figure out what monetization scheme they could right. do. And then now, as we know, they're like, you know, one of the most profitable companies in the world through through advertising. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's premature to really kind of put on really, um, you know, kind of, you know, in the industry, they call it like dirty MTX. Dirty MTX mm. is usually like yeah, yeah. loot boxes or things that are like really have a lot of um, randomness uh, in uh -huh. them, the which are being stuff. sort of, yeah. yeah, which are being like phased out more and more because... You know, a lot of countries now are starting to regulate them <clears throat> mm -hmm. to where, you know, you need to, you need to, like China requires that you disclose the, uh, the percentage chance for everything, like basically the loot table. Mm -hmm. um, they want to see like what percent chance you have to disclose that to the player so they know, you know, if they buy this box, what percent chance do I have to get the thing I want? Right. Right. And so um, more and more those things are being regulated. So it's pushing developers into a corner of like what can they really monetize the game with um something that i think is interesting is that i noticed a lot of the talk among monetization was p a lot of players advocating for subscriptions mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. really interesting because yep. you know subscriptions is, are viewed by business people as like oh that's really hard to get people to subscribe yep um, they're cool again though yeah. like yeah they're, they're, they're the lesser style, of the evils you know? now <laughs> Yeah, because if you think about it, right, like the subscription is so much more conducive to a game like New World or WoW or MMOs mm -hmm. because you can't really MTX the progression system because if you do, it ruins the whole game. Yeah. Um, 
And so I think really, I mean, maybe you could speak about this, Kevin, but I think originally, you know, for a while, the subscription wasn't so much like um, so much about really revenue. It was more about like uh, the service cost is the server cost is incredibly expensive. And this is more to keep the lights on. Really, the box product was a lot of the monetization model at the time. But over mm-hmm. time, the the cost per user for uh, server costs, you know, everyone uses AWS now, and there's a compute mm-hmm. cost time <laughs> for each uh, instance and stuff. And that is going down and down and down over the, every year. Um, so the actual profit margins of the subscription probably for a while has gone increased. Right. I mean, I don't, I'm not privy to the numbers. I don't know, but that would be my my guess mm. yeah but, so I, um, I can talk about a little bit about you know the history of that those conversations um and you know blizzard was very much design first you know gameplay first essentially and that include like that included um you know how how they made profit you know how they how they charge people for things um and and it was kind of different in the in the industry because you know ea sort of had you know i've I've heard that they they have more of a we have a monetization scheme now let's wrap a a game around it you know it's like it's the other way around in in some cases Mm -hmm. Uh, but blizzard really yeah blizzard really was like let's just make an awesome game and then you know figure out how we can sell it um and you know alan adham of course, was huge in establishing that culture. And one of the big things he used to always tell us was don't be greedy, you know, like in that, that really stuck. And, and at, at first we started with, okay, well, we're going to make an MMO and we're probably going to use the MMO uh, pricing scheme, which is box price plus subscription. Um, because that was sort of what everyone was doing. And so we wanted to fit comfortably within what people playing EverQuest or Ultima Online or, or Dark Age or whatever, uh, you know, had already gotten used to. We didn't want to be like shocking and different, um, even though the subscription cost was shocking to like the other Blizzard games, you know, fans. Uh, it, it was very much the norm uh, for MMO players. And then as we got further along and we got close to deciding, you know, what what to actually zero in on like what is our subscription cost going to be is it going to be ten dollars is it going to be five dollars is it going to be twenty dollars um one of the things we you know some of us realized was how far ahead how and this is going to sound really arrogant but that we had a better product that was than what was out there right and this sort of dawned on us and it, it gave it gave some people this idea that well we could charge more for this we could charge 20 because if the going rate's 15 and we have a better product, why don't we charge 20? And again, mm. Alan Adham would step in and he'd be like, don't be greedy. If anything, we should be going down to 10 to try to ease all the StarCraft and WarCraft and Diablo fans into that transition to, we're going to charge you for a different type of game and a different type of experience. And uh, I thought that was really important. And, and again, just kind of masterfully done because it did ease people right into it. Uh, we ended up settling with 15 a month, uh, uh, similar to EverQuest and, you know, other games. But, uh, yeah, it's like we could have done things that were greedier, but we didn't. And I think it makes a huge difference in, you know, the opening, the unveiling of your, you know, game. And so, yeah, another reason that is so disappointing, like, you know, we've been talking about with New World, and, but also just to, to address that other question of um, what does the subscription pay for? Um, it's not just to keep the lights on. It's also an investment in more content, more so than like an expansion, you know, for a game like StarCraft, say. Um, yeah, people bought it and that encourages you to go make an expansion. So they'll buy the expansion because you see a market that's hungry. But, um, you know, wow, in terms of content design is you know, and most MMOs are way more accelerated and the communities are way more demanding in terms of content. So a lot of the justification for subscription is to keep the team spinning, not give them the opportunity to drift off to another project, you know, to like stop doing what they're doing and 
just call it a day, you know, mm-hmm. like, so, which was very common for the RTS side of Blizzard. You know, they would go from StarCraft to a Warcraft game, to an expansion for the Warcraft, back to StarCraft, to a StarCraft expansion. And so all the people that were loving Warcraft <laughs> had to wait. <laughs> but this subscription idea sort of locked the team in place and saying, no, you need to keep people here and doing that thing and k- keep pushing the game forward and providing more. So and I think people, when they think about it, that, you know, that's what their subscription is paying for, um, as well as customer service and, um, and, and also keeping the lights on. They're more comfortable with that arrangement because it creates an expectation that the company is then hopefully delivering on. That's a really great insight. I, I hadn't thought about some of the kind of halo effects of that dependable subscription money coming in and being depend, you know, allocated towards one game uh, would have on like all the devs, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and it's kind of keeps the momentum going right yeah um as opposed to letting it see how it happens and then maybe in three years if it turns out it did well enough we'll start working on the sequel but by that point you know maybe the audience will have moved on because because dev timelines are so long that's pretty right yeah and it's, Um, it's funny because also just you know a lot of times people are like wow blizzard's games are great because they ship it ship the games when it's ready and things like that or they take longer time on mm -hmm. things and you know a lot of that isn't just because you know other game developers are dumb dumbs and like to ship things right. quickly or whatever it's because blizzard had the luxury because really they had they had um steady cash flow because mm-hmm. of the subscribers right and so it allowed allowed the company to to tr- be creative and ex- explore new things or you know uh, start up new projects within the studio yeah more comfortably and so um um so yeah i mean they had also I, I really earned a, thought... a lot of trust with the player base you know the player base r- respected the quality of the eventual product so that helped a lot too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah but i always thought you know though it's it's what it, it's a good model because you know you, um, you just have to make the player the game experience good and just try to like you know think about your 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 players and how many subscribers you have that's like your best metric right Mm -hmm. um whereas a lot of other game developers have to care about they have you know um uh there's like this concept of there's minnows and dolphins and whales and there's certain percentages and you need to monetize them all differently and all these things but really wow never really had to think about that as right you know because you just it didn't matter. It's just there's your subscriber. Or you're not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, that's a, well, that's that a all... go ahead, Luca. Oh no, I was going to switch topics. So finish it up. Oh, I was just going to say, um, this is, this is like, I feel like my voice or the, the voice of this strategy isn't really on people's minds these days. Uh, the strategy that we approached it with. Um, and I'm, I'm just not convinced that it's not a, a good strategy, you know, like try to think of a game and this is very hard to do nowadays. Um, but because the AAA studios are all going a different direction, but think of somebody trying to do, you know, a wow type thing nowadays where it costs a ton of money, but you know, the developers are care about the integrity of the experience and aren't going to do wrong and they're not going to nickel and dime the player base and all that kind of things. And they make an amazing game. Like the idea that that can't be overwhelmingly successful in terms of players and, you know, profit is, it's kind of mind blowing to me that that's not like an idea anybody's running with. It's more of a, let's calculate what our potential minnow dolphin whale metrics are for, these monetization attempts in the first month, in the first three months, six months, it's all very short term rather than like, let's build a thing that we get, you know, multiple millions of people coming to play and then just raking it in from a respectable price, you know? Yeah, because I mean, realistically, New World probably has cost so far at least a hundred million dollars to mm-hmm. in production cost make. Yeah. And so usually how games work and that's why premium games have a sixty dollar cost whatever, because a lot of it's trying to recoup the cost they spent the last three to five years or how how long it took to, to make that game. Um 
to to get back into the you know the black really right right um sorry luca what were we gonna oh, say no um i think it's really easy you know using this example like w we all have our influences and our 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 biases here like this is a clear what feels like a clear example of kind of what not to do coming from a position of kind of like very little trust um or integrity built up you know which in contrast blizzard back in 2004 enjoyed this huge amount of cachet because for years they had been making premium games mm -hmm. done when it's done so people were willing to take them on faith for something like this and then now you're telling me that the the inside story is that designers were even advocating you know adam was wanted to keep it down because he he didn't want it to be um as bracing for players that had never paid a subscription before to right. be able to kind of come aboard and as we all know one of the great you know things that wow did was it just blew open the size of the potential mm -hmm. you know mmo player base and even gamer player base it was a huge cultural event so yeah you can look at this 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 thing from new world and feel like okay that's that's how you know we shouldn't do it there are some obvious no-nos there but but at the same time you know the business of games has evolved mm -hmm. tremendously in the last you know 20-ish years and i don't think any of us would say that wow's monetization model is is sort of the flat out best one right. um or that it's you know universally good and so the fact of the matter is there there are probably times and places for the type of design uh, monetization design that new world's trying to do maybe just misapplied here but like i was curious to hear if you know if you two think there are any kind of universals here besides um you know trust in the player base before you sort of come out with with these sorts of transactions and you know like are there any kind of, um, you know, overall monetization tenets um, or like how, what's your experience been like with, you know, have you ever found different types of monetization appealing, you know, personally? Have there been games, for example, that have had a lot of microtransactions in them where you've ever felt like this makes total sense? Mm -hmm. You know, I like that I don't have to play and I like that I get this kind of snack size content and it has led to me spending more, but I don't really mind because... I mean, I've certainly had that experience, you know, we, mm -hmm. like, I know a lot of people that have said, oh, you know, I've spent hundreds of dollars on Dota 2 or League or something yeah. like that, when they never would have expected to. And it's right. like, well, wow, in this case, that, that worked out super well for these, for these companies, and it felt right, and I'm not even mad at it. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of wanted to zoom the lens back from, from, like, just MMOs and subscriptions a little bit. Yeah, so I think like League, the is, League was one of the first that I was like, wow, this is a free-to-play model that I really like, I really respect, and um, and it works for them, it makes them tons of money. So I was really impressed with League of Legends model, effectively, you know, cosmetics only, um, or buying, buying XP boosts or things where the XP doesn't really translate to your success in the game, right? Like... Yeah, you get to level 30 faster, and so you can start ranked play a little faster, but there's no guarantee you're going to do well ranked, right? You're still going to get stomped on. In fact, you can make an argument mm -hmm. that zooming to the ranked is going to actually stunt your development as a player. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, another example was, uh, uh, sadly it's an MMO, but it's a different type of monetization, was uh, Dungeons & Dragons Online, DDO where they did it free to play and then you bought modules of content essentially you'd spend anywhere between three dollars to ten dollars for you know to be able to unlock dungeons and quests and new zones to be able to run through with your friends and then if you wanted to you know they, they provided free content and then they also provided like that module type based content that you purchased and i thought that was pretty cool Yeah, um, yeah, I'll give my answer to this, and then uh, just we could open up the floor for people to come up, because mm -hmm. um, we do have a hard stop at 7. So, mm -hmm. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of my favorite monetizations, actually, which has really influenced the industry, is the Battle Pass. And the Battle Pass, you know, now is almost 10 years old. It was, you know, came up with by Valve for, uh, for Dota 2. And what was always great about that model too was a portion of the battle pass would contribute to the esports event the international mm -hmm. which players really love and it's like one of the biggest events in gaming um and it was always cool to see that number grow each year um 
for the prize pool for the pro players for Do for Dota, and so it really felt like you were connected to the game, you're connected to the whole, you know, ecosystem, and you know, it felt like your contributions were also, um, in, you know, going to the the player base, mm -hmm. and so that was always cool. Um, yeah, I think I think now though the battle pass is starting to show its age. I feel like it's sort of formulaic now, mm -hmm. and it feels like. Uh, a lot of the rewards in the battle pass, for example, Apex. I really love Apex the game, mm -hmm. but the battle pass has never really resonated with me. It's always like a bunch of icons and little like sprays and things like that. It just doesn't really. It's never really kind of uh, mm -hmm. yeah resonated with me. The, like those mm -hmm. ones, like um, Dota is unique in that they farm out a lot of the cosmetics for the battle pass to the community so they don't have to really pay the upfront costs for all those art assets the community is really doing it and then they just partner with those creators and give them like a tiny cut of mm. the or of the payout which actually could be huge because if you do like a skin for dota 2 you can make upwards of hundreds of thousand dollars as an artist depending on how many people buy the battle pass wow, which yeah. is usually you know you can make a lot right right so so um, I think I think we're I think we're coming around to where people are just, um, you know, getting warming up to subscriptions again because mm -hmm. there's like subscriptions for so many things. I subscribe to YouTube. Premium They've been normalized. I, yeah. 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 It gets rid of the ads. I, I have no problem with subscriptions, um, especially because it just gets rid of, you know, I was telling Luca, I think about this, about the story about Disneyland and when Disneyland first opened. Walt Disney um, was really adamant about it not having um, tickets. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you go to a fair, you get a certain number of tickets. Right. And then you could use certain tickets for certain rides. And there's three ticket rides, two ticket rides, etc. But what that does to the person who goes into Disneyland is it, like, breaks their immersion yep. of the park. Because now you're constantly thinking, well, I want to go on that ride, but I don't want to waste my tickets. Yeah, yeah. You know, what if it's a bad ride? Then I wasted my tickets on that ride, right? right? You're doing these and value so, assessments constantly. <laughs> yeah, and mm. there's no sort of, in Disneyland, there's no sort of, like, gambling sort of games or carnival games. Mm -hmm. Because those are also engineered to kind of, you know, be sort of gambling to get your money, right? Yeah. And so... the by not having your your hand in the the player or the you know the person who goes to a theme park's pocket mm -hmm. uh, every five minutes it really lets them be immersed into what the experience you're providing and um, whenever like you get pop-ups saying oh you can get this for two dollars or or whatever which i know is a lot of roblox games like every roblox game has a pop-up every time you click something asking you for robux right yeah yeah um so so yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting that we are coming around to subscriptions again. And um I noticed your chat and, and whatnot saying Battle Pass is essentially just a subscription, which is true. Mm -hmm. Um but the reason why they structure it as a battle pass rather than a subscription, which is interesting, is because if you do a subscription, Apple or any kind of uh provider you partner with doesn't let you do subscriptions on the platform, but they will let you purchase something. Mm -hmm within the ecosystem so if you purchase the battle pass then they circumvent the recurring revenue sort okay. of model interesting um, yeah i do want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here too and just talk about how um how difficult it is to monetize a, the player bases sometimes like i learned this in the hobby when i was working on hobby games at cryptozoic as well as uh digital games but there's a you know obviously there's a ton of min maxers and generally hobby enthusiasts are very stingy right they're they're always trying to get the most value for the little you know for the littlest pay and so they can be a very tough um, group to effectively monetize now obviously there's still people within that group that are like yeah, give me a $30 per subscription for a game that I believe in and I'll pay it happily, you know, or people that'll throw $100 in cosmetics because they believe in the company and want to reward the good work being done by the designers. You know, there are a fair number of those as well, but um, I think those are more the, um, the aberration than the norm. Um, most people just want as much as they can get for as little as possible, and, and that's just part of our nature as consumers, right? Um, 
So it is very challenging. And unfortunately, it's pushed a lot of companies into sort of that deception mode of, you know, it's free. But of course, you know, the last thing it is is free because you got to buy this and, you know, fill out this and tell us all your dark secrets so we can sell your data and you know, or whatever it is. Right. So, yeah, that, that turns me off so fucking much now. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're saying about, you know, the hobby, the hobby game market those consumers you know that is not a group that is probably going to skew towards enthusiasm for subscriptions and stuff you know mm -hmm. they may have different ways that kind of they they tend to want to value things and i think that this is this is one of the problems is that it's tough to find sort of what the the best like one size fits all monetization yeah. scheme is you know there are plenty of people who will like only want to deal with free to play because they're like i play a bajillion games i bounce around i can't sink 60 bucks on something if it's going to suck and I'm going right. to refund it in two weeks. But then there will be others like, you know, me, the sort of um, the people who still, you know, buy things on Bandcamp and download flax and shit that are like, I want to pay $60 up front. I want to own the game and I don't want anything else in it. Mm -hmm. And you'll see success stories like Cyberpunk, you know, cratering sales records, Valheim, same things with like one time mm -hmm. flat fees. But then you also have plenty of examples of other companies doing well with other ones. And so there's no real like universal best way to do it but i will say that uh, a monetization like when i think about times i've been excited to give a company my money mm -hmm. um like felt like they're you know wow go team company I, I, this is satisfying for me more often than not these days it's with these kinds of um almost this like tip culture the patreon culture where yeah, yeah. there's like a, hu a human face that subs in for you know um the fact that I'm really just getting ready to, you know, turn on a subscription stream to this place and probably never turn it off. But if it's like, if it's, you know, if it's my friend with a Patreon um, that is doing, doing, you know, a weekly podcast, uh, mm -hmm. or if it's, you know, the Signal Foundation, they're like a nonprofit and they're running, you know, an, an instant messenger that doesn't sell your data. Like, you know, I'll donate 50 bucks to them because I'm just like, well, I want them to survive. I'm, I'm voting yeah. with my dollars to keep these people alive even though they've asked for nothing. And I think that kind of like, almost like activist monetization model mm -hmm. has maybe become a little more viable these days too. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't know that I'll see any large game developers taking a leap on it, but right. that's one that I wouldn't have expected. And like, I don't know, what if, uh, you know, humble bundle pay what you want style pricing, I think mm -hmm. um, is probably due another go around as well. It would be neat to see that out of like a, on a larger scale, but I think it's pretty incompatibility with, you know, compatible with spending a hundred million dollars on making your game. You know, yeah, yeah. you can't spend that much and then be like, right. let's just see what the people think it's worth. You <laughs> right. know, like no, yeah. no investor's going to back that. It's not practical. And it's also um, like just one final point on like the Valheim or whatever experience where it's, um, I think that, you know, what happens when, a small company does a, a, a spectacular thing with a normal pricing model or a, what they see as a fair model and then it blows up is you know for every one of those there's like a hundred other people that are like licking their lips trying to figure out how to monetize the hell out of that same success right um so it, mm -hmm. it, it instantly goes to the greed portion you know because like oh this this weird group that set out to make this amazing thing and the last thing on their mind was how do we monetize the crap out of it? Turned out they made an amazing thing. That's got to be a way for us to make money, you know? And so everyone else, you know, the vultures all come swooping in. And uh, just to finish that, the, that just the, could be the, the cynic in me. But... Yeah. I, I realized that the reason, um, like, this ties back to Chris talking about the battle pass. This taps that same energy of, you know, there's a company with a lot of goodwill then they're also putting the players first and foremost and the creators up front too and i think that valve is probably one of the only companies i've ever like watched i've read stuff about how they think about monetization and felt man that's so cool mm -hmm. and not felt like ugh, monetization you know right. like they hired you know what was it the former like economic minister of greece to come and be their their personal economist for a year or two and he had a blog and they made thinking about monetization like academically interesting mm -hmm. and also i think really really palatable as a gamer which is which is wild um and uh 
And they, I think the Battle Pass was one of their biggest innovations, but they were always tweaking little things under the hood. And I remember for years feeling just almost frustrated with how much value Valve was getting out of me, but mm -hmm. like, I, I couldn't be mad. Like they were making the experience better overall, but you're aware that, you know, with trading cards and reselling things on the Steam market, four Steam bucks that you spend on Steam games, mm -hmm. like they're skimming a 70% cut off you, you know, <laughs> right. eight different ways, but like, <laughs> and it's still genius not mad. because yeah. <laughs> you're still not mad because the whole experience is still somehow great. Right. And uh, I think there's just so much to sort of study there, but I wonder how much of that is built off this this theme that we had at the beginning of the show of the, the goodwill of the company and the trust they've established. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if EA were experimenting with stuff like that, would it just get ripped into? You yeah. know what I mean? I have this funny picture of you, like, leaving Vegas with your, you know, pants pockets turned inside out, but your face is covered with lipstick and you're just smiling. <laughs> you know, you're totally destitute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're happy, you know. <laughs> One less so kidney. I, I did like, want to say... <laughs> yeah i, I do want to say also if anybody wants to give their two cents go ahead and raise your hand and we'll bring you up uh, we've got 15 minutes left in the show but um um what was I gonna say i totally forgot what i was gonna say man i just had a fucking mouse over pop up on discord and it's gonna be over part of the video and it's just burned in there forever Oh, this no. is raw, raw live production. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. right. Seat of our pants. Mm. I, well, here's a, here's a question: Is so? Let's say for New World, um, what can they do? Or New World or Ashes of Creation? Let's say, mm -hmm. um, what mm -hmm. could they do in terms of other than subscriptions? How could they monetize the game that uh, that uh, would make players? You know, wouldn't that that would be positive for the game? Let's say. Yeah, because even micro um, or cosmetics are bad now in MMOs. Yeah, well, I saw that conversation too. People are like, you know, and it is true. Is if you put a lot of, you know, cosmetic mounts or like the coolest stuff in the game that is paid for, uh, that also kind of can circumvent the progression system, right? Because now, you know, the best coolest stuff in the game should look should um should come from achievements in the game you know uh so i think that could be dicey also mm -hmm. especially in a in a game where progression is so intertied to the the loop and what the game's about yeah well i i'd love to hear what you two have to say because you're the actual mmo game designers in the room but i'll just reiterate my take which is i think amazon being funded by an infinite money pool um that is everything else that they do um, should have taken the ultimate leap of faith with this and they should have delivered a high quality product and mm -hmm. pretty much put it in people's hands for free and been as good guy and non-invasive as they could have until they sort of figured out what it was safe to do. I think they're trying to wade into a space where people have intense brand loyalty mm -hmm. and people are incredibly skeptical of somewhere like Amazon making video games for them and not taking advantage for them. And they should have treaded super lightly yep. and just tried to glad hands it as much as possible and just given tons and tons of value and, and figured it out later. Like, I know that that's a tough thing to justify, but this just feels mm -hmm. kind of like when Microsoft tried to buy its way into the industry, you know, with the Xbox in 2001, or when you step into, you know, spaces like this, you, I think you need to be prepared to really just eat it for a while. And I'm not talking about the 100 million developer costs that is, you know, just part and parcel of making an MMO. I feel like they needed to be prepared if they really wanted to pull users in and get people feeling like I'll never leave the new world. Mm -hmm. They really would have had to just given everybody the moon for a little yeah. while and then and then figured it out. That's what I would have liked to see, I think. That's the other thing that that ties into that strategy is you're not you're not expecting people to buy the game, like it for a month and then move on and be satisfied with their purchase. Um, MMOs, you're in a lot of ways, you're asking people to transfer their lives into a new space, into a new virtual space where they live in this new place, and their friends are in this place, and their social connections, and right. So it's a, it's a much more long term commitment um, in terms of game design, and so walking up and you know punching them in the gut right off the bat, <laughs> right, is like you have to be. You know, you have to be a pretty special person to go like, yeah, this is the place I want to move to. And, 
spend the you know 10 years you know and it's just not going to happen so you're absolutely right that it should just be welcoming and open-ended open arms and just like come on over you know as much as you can get away with and then get people to connect and you know plant their roots and then see what you've got it's a huge leap of faith but i also remember that you know we were talking about league earlier and in 2009 when they were in beta and getting ready to launch there wasn't a game that did free to play like they did yet Mm -hmm. um someone will probably go and find something that makes me feel like well this one game did it and but like popularly the idea that they were going to launch this game and not charge you anything for it and it was like you could pay 25 bucks for like a founder's pack of some champions but they explained the free rotation and stuff I was playing League avidly during the beta because I loved mm-hmm. Dota so much. It was pre-Dota 2. And I remember the, the conversations in the forums were like, you know, Riot, please don't do this because this is the stupidest business model we've ever heard of. Like, don't give your game <laughs> right. away for free. Like, we want you to survive. <laughs> right. So, like, let us pay you, basically. That's and, funny. like, lo and behold, two or three years later, you know, <laughs> right. they knew they were onto something. But it was a huge leap of faith, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that... Um, there's a space for large companies that can afford to do it to take those leaps. And I think mm-hmm. what feels so bad about this new world look is it's like, you guys could do that, you know? Right. Valve fully develops the entire index knowing that like it may not uptick at all. You guys haven't even released your game yet and you're already mm-hmm. talking about the microtransactions and it's like, mm-hmm. ugh, you know? Yeah. Like, it's a real bad first the impression. It's just, yeah. yeah, I don't know. And those shoes. Yeah, how I mean, you, the other thing with League, I mean, the thing with League, too, and, you know, Do- or Heroes of the Storm also had this critique, is purchasing heroes um, in the game was sort of, I mean, I think today maybe it's, just, maybe no one cares about it, but at the time it was controversial, especially to Dota players, because Dota players were, you know, accustomed to being able to choose any hero in the roster, because it's so ingrained in the game design it's about countering what the other team has and if that hero is unavailable then you can't do that and it kind of could screw you right and so Mm -hmm. um so i mean i'm thinking about that what if you had an mmo and you could uh pay for classes to Mm -hmm. unlock the class yeah ddo had that that actually yeah how how did how did that work out what do the players think about that um Gosh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I was connected enough to, like, forums for that game to really have taken the pulse of Maybe that community. Knows. But um, it was, if if any of the classes on that list were were perceived to be high performing, then people were going to go to the pay to win mm-hmm. type of feeling. You know, like in order to be successful, you had to you know pay for the warforged barbarian unlock or whatever which i remember was like stupid powerful at the start of the game um but uh, yeah so it can be really dangerous but yeah you're right the value proposition is so difficult for people when the balance of things changes there's an expectation that the balance of things is going to change um in terms of like character classes or races or anything like that so it's a tough sell. Yeah, I mean, heroes would take fire for this too because they would launch heroes that just were pretty routinely overpowered for the first couple of weeks, and League did this too. <laughs> yeah. And then they would nerf them after everybody had fucking bought them. Right. And so I, I think that, like, that model's great because Dirty. when you have a rotating, you know, so yeah, when you have a rotating selection, it's like, well, they're going to enter the rotation and it's fine. And I have to admit, I, there were times where I felt good buying a hero in League or in, in HOTS because it was like, I'm adding them to my kind of permanent collection. Like, right. I'm letting everybody know, even though no one's ever creeping my profile, like, I love Medivh, you mm-hmm. know? I'm That's my personality. I'm, I'm pinning him to my profile. Like, in yeah, Dota, yeah. you could in all of your favorite cosmetics and everything too you could show off what you bought when people looked you up but um yeah the game balance really does become problematic there and uh and the other side of that is like if it's perceived to be op then it's it's on the ban list kind of permanently so you literally can't play your character that you paid money for 
Um, well, and if they release it underpowered at launch, then no one wants to buy it because they're like, this character needs to be buffed. Yeah. Why would I fucking buy them? Yeah, and you have so. the stigma of playing <laughs> it, right? Because everyone's like, oh, that character's shitty. Why are you playing that? Get off my team, <laughs> right? All right, we got two guests up here. Um, go ahead and uh, fire off your uh, your thoughts. We've got five, ten minutes left. Yep. Hey guys, uh, I got here a little earlier tonight, but uh, in terms of like buying heroes, a couple things I, I think kind of go with that is that if there's a lot of heroes that are available to purchase, the stigma of buying any of them goes down quite a mm -hmm. bit. Interesting, so, yeah. as a like, um, the time, I, the shotgun approach is better. That's an interesting point, yeah. I think with mm -hmm. Valorant, right, they had unlockable heroes in, along the way that, that weren't as strong. Uh, but another thought is um, Battlefront 2 had the Star Wars Battlefront 2 had a huge um, backlash because they put some of the strongest heroes behind like pretty abusive loot boxes mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with with bad right. numbers. And the average cost to getting any of these was astronomical, plus the chances of you getting the one that you wanted were low. So there was a huge backlash against that model of monetization that i don't think i haven't seen too many people go that strong of a direction since but those are my thoughts yeah that's right i yeah. mean i remember the star wars battlefront thing it was like the, one of the most downvoted things on reddit's history if not wow. the most downvoted thing that was that was wild oh yeah wow. oh yeah that's right the tweet from that poor rep oh my gosh <laughs> yeah they got raked for that that's why i think they rolled a ton of it back um that became a crusade but yeah, that is a really good example of how to how to not do it. <laughs> um, Caesar Tankero, do you want to go next? Yeah, I was wondering if what Amazon is doing here is exploring the monetization that they have seen in other platforms, because mm -hmm. cash shops is something that you relate more to mobile games rather than, well, now it's in every single MMO, I think, but it started in mobile and then kind of mer uh, bubbled up through the industry to MMOs and other kinds of genres. So mm -hmm. one thing that Amazon is doing right here is I don't know if their justification is, hey, we're going to have this awesome game and we're going to monetize the hell out of it and from the start rather than kind of stake their banner in the ground saying, investors, this is what we're doing to make money out of this thing. Come in over and you know invest in this. Or even if it's just an executive trying to prove a point to another audience that is not the player base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the monetization practices from mobile have really been bleeding into AAA games um, and for a reason because they've been really successful yeah but uh, it's a challenge for the AAA games because they're more connected to the player base they're more kind of in the limelight and so when you put the those sort of uh, monetization practices that can be controversial to players in a AAA game um, you're gonna it's it's just, it's a totally different audience right yeah and so yeah Queen of Hearts. But yeah, the, Do you want to take yeah, us out? This is probably the last question we got time for. So, sure. So, um, so my question actually leads off of that. Um, in the, I guess the specific kind of items that New World was talking about offering in their shop, like um, rested XP potions and crafting boost potions and rest or fast travel boost all that stuff um and they mm -hmm. kept you know kept referring to um the quality of life items um and you know for those people who don't have enough time who want to make it to end game and so on and that there just seems to be this stigma in in modern mmo in these, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess modern MMOs that that the earlier game isn't quality of life or, or shouldn't have a quality gameplay. You know, I mean, I when I first played World of Warcraft, I, I mean, I didn't even make it to the top level for like two and a half expansions. And I had a grand time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it was, and it's like, how how do we kind of get companies to think about it as not 
you know, just what's happening at the end, but that an MMORPG should be about the experience overall. And it just, I don't, that was what really bothered me about the whole thing is just this, that, you know, Kevin was saying how bothered he was about it, you mm -hmm. know, and I think it's kind of what I got out of it as well. Yeah, it's an interesting so. point though, that you, the, the target audience for those things are probably the group that are most likely going to enjoy just running around leveling up, you know, by themselves a lot of time. They're not the people that are, you know, trying to get to end game and raid the type of stuff in the game as fast as possible. And um, mm -hmm. so that that's an interesting disconnect as well. Like how many people really do have, you know, the, the proverbial 19 minutes a week to play but expect to be raiding and crushing everything in the game. Um, that, 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 the crossover there is probably really small. And so it more applies to, you know, I joked about bots. Uh, it applies really well to bots. Um, it applies to people that are raiding and, and playing, you know, the game really intensively, but want like second characters, you know, zoomed up really quickly. Um, yeah, how many people are like, I want to play this game, have very little time, have a lot of money, but can't stand playing the first, you know, 59 levels or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that was a really excellent point, uh, Queen of Hearts. I, I think a lot of people resonate with that view. Um, and in, we mentioned it earlier in the show, but tips out tweet of, you know, hey, I'm a dad gamer, but I still don't want you to subvert the game mm -hmm. by adding all these boosts and things to, you know, mess up the journey for the player and leveling, right? Um, but again, I think what's interesting could be, you know, what really is the goal and the vision for for New World or Ashes Creation or all these games? Maybe it really isn't, you know, the leveling journey. Maybe mm -hmm. that is not a big priority, mm -hmm. right? Um, I just don't know, but... Um, all right, uh, CJ, fair. you can actually uh, go ahead and give uh, your thoughts. Oh, I well, I came in really, really late to this because my kid's bedtime or whatever. But uh, <laughs> no problem. No, Dad I just wanted to pop in and say <laughs> that during the time that I was a designer on Heroes of the Storm, I can say 100% honestly that we never intentionally released a hero in an overpowered state with the goal of making it sell better. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. I, I wouldn't. I think it's just an unfortunate like, circumstance, right? Yeah. Like a new hero comes out and that. people don't know how to play against it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, like, the new hero would come out and mess up the meta, but I just, I just wanted to. Yeah. I mean, that's I a guess, good point. It's a know, perception. Stick up for it or whatever. Yeah. It's definitely exactly. a perception, it's but it's. Perception. It's I mean, like so many things. The difference between player perception and internal you know, dev knowledge, right, is pretty far right. apart. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's People, a good, the whole time, very good point. In the whole time I was on Heroes and at Blizzard specifically, every every release we ever did was attempted to be as ethical as possible. Yeah, yeah. Right? An honest attempt. But, yeah. I, I totally believe yeah. that. No, and it's it's really hard to nail the balance on a new it's like, character hard. or a new, a new class. Like, for example, anecdotally, like when the Death Knight came out, the designers were kind of like, just make him sort of over overpowered because, you know, we don't want to, if you're going to come out the gate with a new class, it's better the, for them to be slightly overpowered than underpowered because it just feels lame to play a new class and they just kind of suck, right? But then the DK on release were just out of this world broken, <laughs> you know, they had like AOE fear, like what was that thing oh called the like glyph of something or other that just if you stood in it, everyone just got feared forever, you know, like it was it was just over the top. And so what happened was the team was like, all right, we're not doing that again. Let's try to like, <laughs> let's let's try to make them a little bit underpowered because chances are they're going to be broken anyways, because we don't you know, it's hard to balance things up yeah. like that. And Saturation then the monk time. was. Yeah, then the monk was actually on target of what what we balanced it for, and it was underpowered, and people were like, "This sucks, monk's boring or whatever," <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, it's really hard to to nail the balance of things out well, the game. Yeah, like I was that. gonna say with the uh, saturation time, like when I was on Heroes of the Storm, you know, I mean, we'd test a hero for four months, playing it, you know, 
multiple hours a day and that doesn't even come close to what the community oh, the yeah. amount of hours the community puts in on that hero mm-hmm. within six hours of launch yeah you know what i mean but, all you got to do is juggle the numbers a little better though right <laughs> i know right like you should have known better come on it's easy <laughs> and thanks for uh thanks for popping up and and checking just, me on that because i made that I comment earlier no up. i, I I just wanted to defend totally. my, I, my boys. <laughs> no, I know. I, I worked on Heroes for a while, too, and so it's weird that we're getting our, our wires kind of crossed up here, but that's actually one of the really cool things about these spaces is, like, you could just get my my sort of suggestive disinformation cleared out of the air in no time. Like, we oh, don't that, even have to do a corrections episode. That's right. <laughs> I think that team was 150 it. people yeah. at one point. Like, it was pretty big for a while, but... Anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So I yeah, play a great. lot of yeah, Sergeant all. Hammer is my favorite hero. <laughs> okay, right. uh, uh, that brings out us to the end here. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody for contributing your thoughts and hanging with us um, through this very alluring topic. Um, we haven't figured out next week yet, but we will be back here next Wednesday at 6 p.m., same time. And uh, feel free to chat it up and ask us anything, suggest topics in the Discord till then. Mm -hmm. Um, We love hanging out. And thanks so much for for building the Discord community with us over the last week. It's been insane Uh, (laughs) just to see, like, um, over 100-plus people pile in. Um, There's a real appetite for talking about game design like this, and it's it's so cool to see. So thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. See you next week. Adios. Exit quietly. Why can't why can't I exit loudly? All right, that was that. Hope you guys enjoyed it. That was monetization and game design. We covered a fair number of talk topics. Took a few shots at various players, and uh, yeah, had some great uh, comments. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Um, if you would do me a favor, you know what? The the like button has a headache tonight. Maybe just maybe just some light cuddling instead of the usual. We don't got to smash. Just, you know, light cuddling on the like button. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.